Hello everybody, I'm KP and welcome to Million Dollar Exits, a special segment on my main show, The Building Public Podcast. In this interview series, I sit down with founders who went from an idea to building a business and then eventually selling it for over a million dollars, hence the name Million Dollar Exits. This is something I'm very passionate about and curious about at this point in my career. I want to learn and share all the insights, mindset shifts, lessons, and non-obvious tips that are part of this unique journey with the next wave of founders who want to take this path as well. So buckle up and get ready to be inspired and informed. Here's a special shout out to our episode sponsor, Paralect.com. Million dollar ideas come from every possible niche. If you're a busy domain expert in marketing, sales, finances, or healthcare, and don't want to spend six months just to build an MVP, you'll find Paralect super valuable. Paralect is a venture studio built to design, build, and launch a product for you that is ready to sell in under two months. Start with no code or go full stack right away. Simply focus on growing your early adopter community and build in public, and they'll take care of the rest. Build your million dollar startup with Paralect.com. P-A-R-A-L-E-C-T.com. Today, I am super thrilled. I have uh, one heck of a guest today. And I mean, we were just chatting before we hit record about what seems to be a Midas touch that he's got going in the last two, three weeks. He had a fantastic exit, great outcome for a software company called Tweet Hunter, and just was announced last week or earlier this week that he is the maker of the year at Product Hunt. Without further ado, would love to welcome Thibaut to the William Public Podcast. Welcome to the show, Thibaut. Hey, KP. So happy to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Thibaut, your story has been everywhere on Twitter, the Twitter wars in the last two, three weeks, ever since you announced the Tweet Hunters exit and the next chapter post acquisition. First, I would love to, on behalf of every indie hacker, every bootstrapper, every founder that you know follows the podcast or listens to my content, I would love to say congratulations. Great outcome. Really happy for you. What's been so amazing for me and so like fascinating and fun is to follow along from afar almost every step that you took along the way to get to where you are now. And it felt like the time just flew. I don't know how you felt like it was, I don't know you said it was two years since you started this or, but in my head, I thought like it was like two months ago, you started Tweet Hunter and now suddenly you have an acquisition. But walk us through how you're feeling right now. You know, you must be feeling a mixed bag of emotions or one predominant emotion like what are some give us a view into your head right now so like right now it's it's crazy in my in my head because uh, th- th- there was the acquisition and like I was expecting it we, we worked on that for for months and so I knew it was going, going to happen but like yesterday there was this announcement about me being the maker of the year by Project Hunt. And Project Hunt is something that is super important for me. It's, it's big. Right. So it was a big deal. And this one was totally unexpected. I didn't even know that I was I have been shortlisted or, or anything. So I'm, I'm like, I was trying to, to scream this to everyone <laughs> what I was meeting yesterday. And like most of my family don't even know what is Project Hunt. But right. <laughs> you know what? On, on this live podcast, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to bring you uh, the I'm gonna bring you the golden kitty <laughs> that you're gonna hopefully see I don't Whoa. know if it's gonna be a different version of this but this was last year's golden kitty that well, I won for community member of the year yeah you're gonna love it and I was you know in, in the same shoes just like you and it's also ironic and somehow like philosophically that's just really how I think like the universe the world works like right you don't care for it you genuinely just do it for the love of it for the joy for the intrinsic motivation and you just keep on doing it and then suddenly out of left field you get the news like that right i was in your shoes i was like stunned because i know there were much much bigger and better and smarter people who were in the right lineup you know for the award last year and i was like i didn't even think about it because i'm like that's not and then when i found the news i was like oh this is crazy you know but that also was because genuinely i was not attached to the outcome yeah and I i'm sure you felt the same way right because you're they not attached to the outcome. We just yeah, I was already. I was, I was actually looking at my GitHub history, and I think like I have pushed code in the last uh, four hundred days almost every day, and I feel exactly what you said. Like it's because you are you are genuinely interested in what you are doing. It doesn't feel like work that's it's making it possible to last. 
If you're yeah. not having fun, it, it definitely cannot last. Yeah. Yeah. And also, let me also tell you this. I want to check in with you in 12 months when this will be a part of your gallery in the background and you will never think about this. Thing there. Like it's just what I felt was for two, three days, I was so grateful. I felt a sense of gratitude, cause especially because I'm like, wow, they, I'm grateful for all the people who voted and all these things. And after that, I just completely moved on to the next next thing. And I had really no recollection until somebody mentioned this or when this situation comes up. And I, I'm curious this because this is important for us to all remember who, who, all the founders and entrepreneurs in this journey. The summit that we think, like the peak that exists on the top, like when we get there, that feeling is, only exists for like two, three, four days. And after that, you're like, okay, what now? What's next? Have you arrived that yet? Or are you still like for now cherishing the summit for now? Oh, not just product time, but I'm like acquisition too. Well, that was a bit the case like today. Like every time I receive a DM or a, a bug report, like it gets me back to reality and to, I have to work. I have to make yeah. users happy. So yeah, it's uh, happening. That's the, and so, so for the folks who may not know much about Tweet Hunter, the story, can you recap? So the theme that I've been uh, talking about in this podcast, especially with this segment, is idea to exit, right? And any inflection points along the way. So can you walk us through a bunch of inflection points that you can remember from the idea, the aha moment to acquisition? I had a couple of failures in the past. Uh, Just a couple? <laughs> Way more, actually. Like, right, right, right. We, yeah, both yeah. of us. Yeah, but there is there is something that I think is very big is that uh, when you have an ID, you love it so much that you are trying to convince people that that the ID is actually good. And like my first startup typically suffered from that. I don't know if the ID was good or not, but we didn't even care validating it. And something that we wanted to do differently this time was was validation from start. And that's why we started this crazy challenge of shipping one new product every week. And every week? Wow. Yeah, every week. It was in like 2021, early 2021. It, I think it, it lasted about four months and we shipped 10 or 11 products in wow. four months. And every time we were looking at only one thing was revenue. Yeah. If, if the product was not generating revenue, uh, we just moved on to the next thing. And I think like out of the 11 products, four actually made revenue, but not enough. And Tweet was the last one of the 11th and from the very, very beginning, it took off like very fast. You could tell that there was a pull from the market about this as opposed to, yeah. push, as opposed to pushing it? Yeah, because it was, it was super simple. Like we tweeted about our projects, but for every other project, when we were not promoting them, the acquisition stops directly, like no word of mouth. For Twitter, it was a little bit different. We just, we tweeted about it, we posted on Reddit, about it but even even when, when we were not doing it it seemed like we we still had acquisition we still had traffic and we still had people subscribing that was crazy for us it was the first time it happened mm. so we decided to work a little bit longer on that and the week over the week growth had been very big so i think when we crossed like 1k mr about one or two months after the soft launching it we decided to just stick on it and work on Twitter a little bit more. Right. So that was one inflection point, the validation, right? And then so what happened after that? So I was promoting Tweet Hunter. Like I was sending a lot of DMs to a lot of people. And one of them was GK Molina. It's like he's a Twitter ghostwriter working for clients. He didn't have a huge audience at the time, like I think 30 or 40K uh, Twitter followers. And when I DM'd him, it was, he was like, this is perfect. This SaaS is exactly promoting the technique that I'm teaching in my course. The, it's the aligned to his like, philosophy, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, this is actually watching at great contents will make you write great contents. And this is exactly what the tweet hunter is about. Like it's a way to find great contents on your niche. And at the same time, trying to write something new, taking inspiration from these great contents. Mm. So this guy, GK Marina. By the way, he's, um, he's going to come on the podcast too at a separate date. Another oh, nice. 
Yeah. I hope he's going to say the same thing as I am. <laughs> right. So I'm curious to hear his side of the story of, of yeah. the journey, right? But yeah, keep going. Sorry. So he said, I want equity. I want to be in the projects. And we were very surprised, but we said yes. Basically, like we, we built this very specific contract. He didn't have equity, but it was like uh, shares of the product, not the company. And together, we worked very closely and we, we planned Twitter, uh, a Twitter launch on September 2021. And it went big. Like from just this launch, we went from 3K MR to like almost 20. Wow. And, and it was like the beginning Huge. of it's, it was getting big. Like it was, it was debated. We, we were planning on paying ourselves. So it was like, no, was this, a, sorry, at this point, was this a Twitter launch or was this a product hunt launch? Twitter launch, Twitter only. Yeah. You can, we can really ask GK about it. Like he, he planned something that was quite solid mailing list before having people to, to subscribe early to get some advantages. And then, and then the big launch with like a lot of other Twitter influencers talking about, about the product. So he, he did very well. And then what we anticipated is like, we should have churned, like we should have put churning yeah. out of the product and the next right. month should be a big slowdown on the acquisition, but right. it didn't happen. Wow. That, that's a great sign. Right crazy there. Part. Yeah. Right. So this is, I think this is like the next inflection point It's like the word of mouth on these products was, was super big. And I guess it's also because, because you have a Twitter product, your users are actually building an audience. And if they are successful, they will promote you yourself. And so you will grow. So the right. product led growth is quite strong on this. Right. And then that brings us to the final inflection point where was it you said at some point you were paying your salaries as well correct yeah i think we started in january january 2022 right so and, and so you grew to did you grow to 100k mrr because I, I actually i don't remember because i saw about the 20k 30k i think i've seen that at that point but i haven't seen the latest when just before acquisition so the, the thing that we did very good i think is and maybe that's a little bit why i got to maker of the year is we just continued shipping relentlessly like we shipped the product hand launch with a bunch of new features a few months after the Twitter launch. We shipped a Twitter challenge where during three months, people had this challenge of just growing their Twitter and they right. were totally free. We shipped a lot of very small products, totally free. That was right. just helping people to grow on Twitter in the hope that they will then convert to Twitter users. Right. A lot of new projects. And we shipped this crazy thing where we gave 1% of our company to a bunch of Twitter influencers oh. without really asking for anything in return. Right. So we, wow. we made it very easy for them to say yes, and they agreed. And then we hoped that they would promote us, and they did. So that's of course right yeah and i think that was a very big part of the growth so it's like shipping a lot of related side projects that would fuel the growth and this and at the same time gather a lot of very influenced and important people around us that would promote us yeah and so walk us through when was the first time you had the idea or the intention to you know get acquired like when did that thought first pass your Head, cross your head. I think that was one of the like uh, foundation ID mm. of the company. Like from the very very beginning with my co-founder Thomas, we said like, yeah, let's just try to build one project and set it in a year. So it actually took two years. But the idea is like we actually we, we love building new things, and by building something and trying to set it in a year, we would just start over the next year. Right. And just keep you, you enjoy the zero to one phase. And so exactly. you're like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think we are quite good at it. The thing is what, what you realize after is that once you did the zero to one, you are actually making a lot of more money by doing from one to 10. Right. Then <laughs> set it and doing the zero to one again. Mm. So we continued a little bit further and we found this awesome company to be acquired from it's right it's great i don't know if you know the story but the guy was actually in my in, in the same school as me yeah was, so was, was, what's his name guillaume guillaume Mubesh. 
Yeah, Mir, I thought I saw him on some other YouTube video. But does he have a YouTube channel, correct? Yeah, he's quite big on on YouTube and Instagram. And he's an uh, indie indie founder too, right? Like he's a bootstrap founder yeah. too, I think, is it? Yeah. The bootstrap big company right now crazy like, like his company lemlis is doing cold email outreach right right yeah and it has nothing to do with personal branding but he built his entire company through his personal brand right so we were like an, an obvious addition to his company mm. because he trusts personal brand to be the way of the future to sell right and we are actively promoting this way of selling. Yeah, it looks like I should chat with him because I believe that too, you know. I would, I think I should bring him on the podcast because I think that is the future, right? It's the creator-led movements around whatever you want to build and when I when I mean by creator, I don't mean like just TikTok influencers. I mean, you know, people who have not just attention but also trust and that's personal brand you know right like a lot of people just have attention they don't have trust like a lot of meme pages a lot of shit posting pages on instagram they just have attention like there's 4 million views on some of this shit but if they drop a t-shirt there's like 15 people who buy it but what james clear has for example is both attention and trust right when he drops something new it's going to be as, like ryan hoover has both attention and trust so i think it's important to build trust as well which i think is the foundation of personal brand you know um, it's, it's so, so true like when you receive cold dm or cold email the trust that you have in the guy is is actually zero like you have zero. you have seen no uh, proof I, no, nothing no way to to trust the person so if you knew the guy because he's constantly publishing on linkedin or twitter and he's sharing all his knowledge the trust is way higher I, the other thing too is i think personal brand is just think of it i mean i've never really realized the power of this tibo until only like last 2 3 months or maybe like last year maybe is if three people in your life when you were younger told you that they like you because you're a giver right because you're a person who wants to give first with no expectations and you just uh, that's they like they describe you as the kind of person who is a giver you know that's just how you, they think of you you just have to bring that mindset and philosophy to the internet across all the things you do because that's what I've done I've done nothing different in my content or in how I interact with people it's just that in real life I like to be a giver where I just give if I can and don't worry about attachment things attached and when you do that on the internet people are shocked because most people are not like that most people are transactional like there's this concept of mercenary versus missionary right and so most people are mercenaries they're trying to like close the deal right there like quick win quick money and if you just give without expectation and i'm seeing this with alex hermosi whose book i'm reading and he talks about this all the time he's like the people who are at the top 1% of personal brands or billionaires or some of these hyper successful people they just operate at a time horizon that's like 10 20 years and they try to cash in in the 19th year they don't try to cash in in the first year they just give like give give value it's okay so i think that's one other thing like i feel like a lot of indie makers and indie hackers i wish that they told me when i was starting out in indiehackers.com when i was 2018 it was very transactional people were like trying to like get the first client get the first customer as opposed to let me help you can i add value for you how can i solve your problem for you you know like that this is a different mindset and and you can you can hear it in like every startup pitch or every core yeah. email all those people they are talking about themselves first yeah they're not, it's all they're not 90% is it. like me 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 how is it better yeah, how, yeah. was this exactly. what's in it for you right or what, what people care is what's in it for them so and then so to your point about this like i mean i guess i guess we're extending the personal brand discussion but i think it's worth it because a lot of the times developers as you know a lot of developers are anti social in the sense that they're anti talking about what they're building or anti having a big public persona and i understand because they feel like they're confusing building a personal brand on attention and trust with bullshit fame like nobody wants this you know uh, tmz fame you know we're not talking about that we're talking about if you don't know of that person enough number of times how are you going to get those doors open you know so you have to have some way of adding value to the world consistently that's not just your product right like in your case what i've seen from you is a lot of what you've done in the last 2 years was not just to promote tweet hunter a lot of what you did like even the twitter growth university or something you guys did all of that stuff was genuinely like this is helpful to anybody who may use this right and like i saw the twimex acquisition too that was also very on point very clever but also very like 
that's a great move, right? Like it's not just about Tweet Hunter. I think it's a great move, you know? Yeah, I felt that. Um, so we, we were growing quite quickly and I was actually worried about the size of the market itself. And, and so we had this chat with Toma about what we should do and how can we think long term. And one thing was actually not only promote Tweet Hunter, but promote a personal branding. Right. And where that's, we need to get more people to start building their personal brand because it's a great way to grow a business and not enough people are seeing this right now. So right. that's, that's why we acquired Twimax to just reach more people and just push this new, this new thing. And that's, that was exactly the point of the growth challenge. It's like helping people build something for themselves. It's not, mm. it's not just a contest where if you lose, you lose everything because and you right. go there. Like in, right. in this case, you cannot lose. Like if you do not win the prize, you still build something for yourself, like this mm. audience. Yeah. So so then to walk us to the last part where you were approached for a strategic acquisition and what was your so, thought like at the time? You were like, Okay, I know this guy from middle school, seems like it's great alignment. And then what happened after that? Like it was you know, tell us the rest of the story. Because there's some, there might be some folks who haven't read the thread that you posted. So just just before that, I just I, want, I didn't share it on Twitter, but we we paid someone like we paid someone to help us sell the company. And oh, it, it, it didn't work like at mm. all. And it's so you had it like a broker. You had a broker yes, to sell. But I don't think he's he's bad. I, I really think he's a good one, and we right. paid him like quite uh, big money. Right. But every people had that he he introduced us to was like big companies with very old patterns, and I don't mm. think they understand the power of personal brand. Yeah. And that's it. Took someone like, like him to really get it, right? You have to really get it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like. Guillaume was perfect and I actually I, I reached out to him like one year before and at the very beginning we were just like chatting as as startups, just 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 sharing feedback, sharing French feedback. founders. Is, yeah. is he French too? Yes, he's French. Yeah. Yeah. And so when we got to the sale, we had this talk that I was setting and at the very beginning he was just sharing some advices about how to sell. And at one point I think like he realized that it would be perfect for him. So we started the, the heavy discussion about the sale. And what was crazy, like the, the conversation with all the other people was so difficult. It was like very big emails and like you had to think about what you were re like what we were writing. But with Guillaume, it was like just a WhatsApp group. And in <laughs> like in 10 days, we had pretty much everything covered on the acquisition, mm -hmm. like wow. all the numbers, all the negotiations happened on WhatsApp super fast because we were like same age, same culture, um, right. same country, same language. So it went so fast. And he was the, like, like all the others, he asked us to say like two years in business, but compared to all the other companies, staying two years and working with him was like... <laughs> Totally different perspective. Right, right. It would be less of a job, more like just doing what you're already doing, you know, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think, I'm assuming he'll give you that full freedom, like he just doesn't want to meddle that's, with. Yeah. That's exactly why we said yes. He mm. said like full freedom. He knows that we are entrepreneurs, that we like, we value our freedom super high. So yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So give us a quick recap on the acquisition details. If you, I don't know how much you can speak about it, but I know you tweeted about the details. Yeah. So it, it's above eight figures. So like above uh, 10 millions. That's the entire deal because Twitter and Tapio are quite like are quite risky businesses. Platform like, risk. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like big, big platform risk. Yeah. Um, most of the money is based on earnouts. Uh, both on most of it is, is, is based on performance. So basically, we have this goal of going to 10 million AR to get uh, all the money. But it's not it's not like all of or nothing. It's like it's right. yeah. It's like step function. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of CEOs' compensation is similar to the you know like a lot of public company CEOs, right? When somebody joins Adobe as CEO and the stock set. $55, you know, there's like a step function. They have to, you know, grow the stock value and then they get some percentage of whatever shares. So that makes sense. No. So, but it, it, I mean, it seems like a, I mean, just outside, 
in looking outside and seems like an ambitious target though 10 million arr where where are you right now i cannot say <laughs> oh okay. so we, have you what was the last public number you posted on twitter i think i think it was like 1.5 million okay. arr okay okay um so so you crossed the million and so now the journey is 1 to 10 yeah exactly yeah this is this is fun and this is a and when i when you say million it's not just uh tweet hunters tweet hunter plus top leo correct exactly okay. exactly yeah, so it, it seems ambitious, but uh, the number are growing quite quickly right yeah. now. No, now now that I hear what your benchmark was and you shared on Twitter, I think it's not that ambitious now. You know, given that you get us one point five, and you guys have great momentum. You clearly category leaders. You know, I think there is not any that are like as big as you are. There are some that are like you know smaller in the indie indie world. That's another thing I actually wanted to ask you. Thibaut, when you first started out, they were like, it's a crowded space. It was a crowded space. It's still a crowded space. What was your mindset around navigating competitors and competition? It depends. Like, it was a crowded space. But if you look carefully, you have tons of SaaS that are dedicated uh, to posting on social media. And take, right. take something like Buffer. Buffer. You can post on every social media with Buffer. Right. But the, the market of tools dedicated to Twitter only was quite small. Right. And when we started Twitter, we had no idea where it would go. But then we had this talk about LinkedIn and how should we include LinkedIn. One of our competitors, like Hyphery, was it had this feature of posting on LinkedIn. Cross, cross posting, yeah. Yes, cross posting. And we said no. Like no, we would not do it and we would be a Twitter pure player. And to support LinkedIn, we would create these other products, Tapio. Oh, Tapio. Because we wanted to be the best on each social media. Right. And what we wanted to do is like having Twitter to be the best tool for Twitter. And it, at the very moment where you start supporting many social media, you add so many constraints. Yeah. That will make, it will make you the UX crazy so hard. and horrible yeah. to, to navigate or you will not use the full capability of each social media. Yeah. You're probably going to use like 10% of, yeah, of yeah. the feature set. Yeah. That's the case for Buffer. If you want to go, to go deep on Twitter, Buffer is going to be the worst because it, it offers so, so right. less compared to so, so I, I like how niche down and focused you were about this, right? You wanted to build the best in class product for the niche of Twitter creators. And then you took the mindset and said, let's build the best in class for LinkedIn creators. You didn't say, let's just build something that works across five other channels. Yeah. And by the way, I really think that there's a huge market if people want to do the same for like Instagram or TikTok or maybe really? YouTube. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's like it's not covered, but there's, right. it's, it's so big. Right, that's crazy. I mean, hopefully you can get collect all those stones, like infinity stones, you know, and then get to that 10, 10 million or even more. So tell us a little bit about the first chapter, right? The validation chapter. I think a lot of people who are listening to this podcast and a lot of people in your network and my network, I feel like they either underestimate validation or they're too attached to uh, one particular idea that they always wanted to push it to the market. Tell us about sort of what would be like three tips you would give for someone who is in the validation phase right now? The, I think that the First one would be to just be careful about what you actually value. In my first startup, I was so happy to share at a family dinner that I raised money and that right. I had hired a team of 10 people. And it's, mm. I felt so important sharing this. Like my This is a rite of passage, by the way. Everybody goes through this. Headcount, let me tell you, headcount is the dumbest thing to brag about, right? It's like that's like it Google is. bragging. We have 150K people. Like that's so dumb. Like why would you brag about? And that's why they're laid off a lot of people now. So it's like, you can't control that anyway. Anyway, go on, sorry. But it, it, like it, it worked. It worked to your parents or to people. Yeah, yeah, people yeah. Right, right, true. Right. Yeah, so, so oh, yeah. He's the, he, he's the boss. He's an entrepreneur managing 10 yeah. people. Yeah, exactly. So I think that that's the first thing to realize. And um, you have to move on from that to revenue. Mm. Um, I really think that revenue should be the main KPI to look at. And yes. when people say that they would buy if or they will buy when, it's, it's not validation. You need right. to have them pay now, and that's going to be the real proof that they, they find value in what you do. Mm. 
what I'm going to say. Uh, sorry, I lost You said two. <laughs> why, why didn't you come up with a third tip? Something that was painful for you to learn, but you did, and you were glad that yeah, you did so, learn. Some, something that's, that I really want to remind people is that when you look at Twitter right now, it's, it's a full suite of Twitter products. You can do many things, scheduling, we support uh, all formats. It's big. But when we launched, it was just one feature and only one feature. Mm -hmm. It was, it was just an input field where you just, you were writing, like you were writing marketing and, and it would retrieve viral tweets about marketing. That's mm -hmm. it. That was the only thing. And people were paying for that, for mm -hmm. personalized based on their interest and their writing tone, a feed of viral tweets that they could get inspired from. Mm. So most of the time you, you feel like when you are building products, you need to build everything at once or you will not convince people. Mm. I really think that, that you need to get rid of most of the work and try to ship way faster, like two weeks with a very limited set of features and one, one very powerful core feature that would differentiate you from everything that's actually on the market. So I actually, I think that's a very, very strong point that you make there, right? I think a lot of people, again, overlook that power of having a killer feature, right? What's the one feature people will talk about? I remember when I first tested Tweet Hunter, I had an aha moment when I first, like there was an input box, like you said, and I put some building public or something. And then I saw like 20 tweets that were generated based on like that keyword. And I was like, wow, they're doing a Twitter search and bringing surfacing the highest liked or highest, you know, retweeted tweets with the same keyword. And I thought that was a killer feature to your point, right? My question is, w w was anybody else doing that? No. See, so there's something here, like I feel like a lot of the times, even though there are players in the category, you know, which you cannot avoid, there will always be players in the category. You can always create something that doesn't exist in the market and yeah. have a little differentiation on top of that, right? And that, so, that, right. Was, the time, that was the time where GPT-3 just came out. And a lot of people were rushing on GPT-3 as a, a, like a, a completion tool, like a, ge a text generation tool. Right. And, and we used it a little bit differently. Like we used it to try to, to compare tweets and what the user were usually talking about to try to find a match between those mm. tweets. And that's how we managed to get this Twitter search super relevant because it was, it was actually using the new next gen ai tools ai apis to try to find the best tools and the the ones that are the closest to what you are usually talking about mm. so all those new technology just take a step back and try to look at how people are using it right now and how differently it can be used because all the people will will, will just jump on the obvious use cases and you might right. not want that Right. So to recap what you said about validation, you know, in that chapter, in that phase, there's three tips. One is don't do it for headcounts or some fake KPIs, you know, societal KPIs. Do it for other reasons. Number two is that revenue is the only KPI that matters, which I fully agree. And the third thing is build a killer feature and have a limited scope, right? I think that itself is a huge, if somebody can do these three, I think that they're already on their way, right? Tell us your journey about from let's say the first validation point, maybe first paying customer to 1K MRR. What does that look like? What are some tips or what are some pitfalls to avoid there? So the, what well, was the first thing that I, I, I did quickly about, quickly after shipping the product was report feedback to Thibaut, which was a, a button that would redirect directly to my Twitter DMs. And that way I was having like, I was having like one user out of two, I, I guess at the very beginning, who was DMing me about their experience on the tool and, and giving me feedback. And mm. that's, that was actually still the case until like three or four months ago, like the support button inside Twitter too were still redirecting to me, to my DMs. Wow. And that's way. So lightning fast feedback loop for you. Yes. And I was trying to implement user feedback super fast, like to give the, the best in class supports and to like give users the feeling that I was listening to them carefully. Mm. Mm. It worked. I added a lot of new features 
based on that, and it quickly made us go to 1K MR. So while you were in this zero to 1K MRR phase, how were you paying your bills and other things? Because you were not paying yourself a salary at that point. What were some other ways you managed to stay afloat? So we have this amazing country, which is France, <laughs> where we, we pay a lot of taxes. Right. But, so I benefited from unemployment benefits. I just received money from the States uh, for just not, not working. So it, it right. helps a lot. And I feel insanely grateful for that. Right. Stayed will, afloat will, for like what, one year. How long were you on uh, unemployment? Years. Two years in France. No way. You were, this is crazy. You were, you were on unemployment for two years. Yeah. So you, you, like you do not get the full amounts of what you previously had, had as an employee, but you can still get a lot of money from that. And, but just, just to just moderate that, keep in mind that I will pay a lot of taxes on the right. sale of Twitter. Right. Which of course, will yeah. be way bigger than what I received. Right. Right. So you're paying your debt back to the to the great yeah. country of France. No, but I think yeah. no, the what stuck out for me was not that, you know, how big of a check you were drawing from France, but so much about your humility in accepting and sort of embracing that lifestyle. You know, because you came from what I heard earlier is that with dinner parties and with family, you were like the guy who had 10 people reporting to you, right? You had a head count of 10 people. You were a venture backed founder in that previous chapter. So that must be really humbling to and, go and on, I think you know, Francis unemployment. Like, yeah. It's bigger than this. It's like when you are at school or university, yeah. it's like what you hear nonstop is you are in one of the best school of uh, the country. You True. will be project manager. You will manage a lot of people, and that's gonna be your your career. And that's like I heard this so much that when I started with my first startup, the only goal was hiring people, hiring like ten interns and have them to work and managing. That everything was just running smoothly. Right. What we did differently this time is like no hire, build myself, and HRV made us go way further. The crazy thing is that on the early stages, you have to move so quickly, like you have to move on from a project to another so quickly that I think it's unsustainable with employees. Like yeah. the employees would feel like you have no vision, which yeah. is a little bit the case. Like you're just trying to figure out things. And that part is much easier if you build yourself. Yeah, I feel like, you know, I think it was Nawal who said, if there's only two real thing, two real tasks in building a startup, I think if you can build it and if you can sell it, you know, that's enough. You have a startup. So there's either one person whose job is 24 hours building something, shipping stuff. And then if there's some other person who's 24 seven, you know, selling or marketing, I think that's a complete team right there. You don't need an army of interns or army of employees initially. Um and what, what was amazing with my co-founder, Toma, is that we were both on, on those both topics. Like we, yeah. we were both building. I was uh, the developer and he's very product and design. And at the same time, he's the marketer, but I'm also selling a lot on Twitter. So yeah. we, we, we are both very accountable on those both topics. Right. And you're both very, com and I think very compatible too, to each other, right? Like you're not sort of doing redundant things, you know, but you're, you're complementing each other's strengths and skills. And like I've seen his tweets, I've seen your tweets, they're different, right? You're, you're both telling two versions of the stories, two different stories. The other thing I'll say is a tip for, you know, other founders, you know, is, is if you can't sell, my hack is just build in public. Because I think building in public will teach you how to sell. Even if you don't know traditionals, because I never went to a sales course. I never took anything. But because every day I respond to DMs, every day I respond to people's replies and tweets and stuff like that, I learned how to present an offer. I learned how to like, you know, when I see JK, I feel like, oh, this is how you write the offer. Oh, this is how you have a sense of urgency at the end, right? Like you have to create some of these things. But you if you don't know how to do sales, just build in public because people will teach you. You're forced to learn in public. Right, because you're in you're in the public domain, you know. So yeah, that that's one um, tip there. And, and I, with you, Thibaut, I feel like you were particularly good at building in public, in my view. You know, I haven't seen much of Thomas tweets, but I think you were sharing the journey along the way, writing threads, you know, keeping us all in the loop. And building in public felt very hard at the very beginning, but the thing is, is you don't have to be good to start. Yeah, you just have to do it, and you yeah. and you become. 
you become good after it's you you it's look great. at your own tweets like now like one of now your threads are so well formatted like they're like you've got all the checks and i when i look at your tweet uh, threads now i'm like he's got the craft now early on i mean you and even me early on we were all like winging it we were like dumb shit right right <laughs> Which is like yeah. and writing most, without most, any formatting. The thing is, like, I think most people would give up after three months or six months because they are yeah. not good enough yet. Yeah. But just the best will just continue, even if they are stuck at just one or two likes. But it doesn't matter. You will become good in the end. Yeah. The, I mean, it just reps and sets in iterations. Actually, so this is another topic that I wanted to ask you about because you're the person who is like has the best seat in this new phenomenon that people are seeing, right? Which is explosion of threads on Twitter. A lot of that, I blame you and Tweet Hunter, just kidding. But <laughs> what is sort of, how should people think about this? I think what's happening is there are people like you and me, we believe in reps and sets, which means we have to keep creating content that works. And over time, it get better and better and better. And so we want to be in the domain. I want to be in the arena. I want to create content be on Twitter. But then there are some people who create two or three tweets or two or three threads and then they look at other people's threads and they don't like them. They're like, oh yeah, this is like a thread boy thread. It's like, oh, this is just... A... And they, they're feeling repulsed and they're like not creating content because of somebody's bad thread. What's your overall take on threads and how should people embrace them if you think they should? I think Twitter is doing quite a good job at, at filtering contents. And, it's, and I think Elon changing Twitter will, will make it even better in a way that it's not a problem that you have a lot of more threads. If you see a lot of more threads, which is a little bit different, it means that most people are enjoying them mm. or Twitter will just change the algorithm. If you are suffering from uh, seeing a lot of threads and you don't like them, it means that you are a little bit different from most people and you might, and you have a lot of ways to tell Twitter, you just don't want to see threads anymore. You can mute words, it's quite easy. And I do it for some very specific words. Mm. What, what I mean is that the Twitter algorithm is actually quite good compared to what a lot of people are saying. And it's doing the job at uh, giving you what you want to see. Right. So just train the algorithm the way you want it to see, huh? What I mean is that the more threads or the more tweets, the more value is outside. And then it's a question of finding it and sending this value to the right people. Mm. So in terms of threads as a strategy, what are your tips for someone who's just starting out Twitter? Like someone who just started Twitter, let's say there's an indie developer from Berlin. You know, they're a fantastic developer, but they just have 400 followers on Twitter. They're just starting their journey. Give them a sense of three or four tips that you would give for them to grow and, you know, build an audience. My main tip would be to optimize for fun, because mm. if you do it for like one or two months, it, it will not work. So you, mm. you need to find a system that will work on the long term. Mm. The second thing is at the very beginning, don't optimize for quality. Because mm. if you do, you will not ship anything. Optimize for quantity. Just have publish a lot of content. And then that will give you the keys to understand what's working and what's not working. And then the quality will come. Mm. And the third thing I would say is make friends. Like This is one of the best Twitter strategy ever is having people who want to support you because you are you. And it makes the journey so much fun. When one of your Twitter friends will reach success, you are so happy for them. And when you have problems, you can reach out to them and ask questions and they will reply. And I have found so many great things thanks to Twitter friends. I have mm -hmm. met some of them in real life. One of them introduced me to an awesome group of indie makers in Bali. It's, I think it, it really made my Bali experience so much better. Mm -hmm. So yeah, many things can happen from just Twitter friends. Right. I mean, I think I'll share a lot of that with you as well. My entire career, I think, was catapulted because of Twitter, you know, because of one decision that I took in 2018 casually to be more intentional and build in public on Twitter. Everything changed from then. And I don't think there are other platforms. Maybe there are, but I don't think other platforms are as great for founders, you know, as Twitter is, you know. 
So in conclusion, what's next for you? What are you most excited about for this year? What are you going to do with all the money? Just kidding. What, what's, what's next for you? I bought the Lumbo. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't uh, wait to well, see your YouTube channel with, with, uh, with the Lambo, you know? On the, on the side here. Like right, yeah, like Ty Lopez, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So no. Uh, so you should like actually you... tweet from inside the Lambo, like, you know, and say <laughs> tweeting from inside the Lambo. <laughs> coding inside. Maybe. Right, coding, that's true. Uh, so during during two years, I will have this crazy goal about going to 10 million AR. It's going to be a crazy journey. I haven't managed products that will go that far ever. Mm. So uh, it's it's going to be a crazy journey. I will I will try to share a lot on Twitter about everything that happens, about the nice and the ugly things about the acquisition. I will have to learn how to collaborate more and integrate more with Lemlist because they have a big team and they have so much talent there that uh, we would need to just learn a lot from each other. And then after that, I'm pretty sure Lemlist is so cool that I would want to stay there. So I have no plans for after. We see. Mm. But never say never. You never know, right? Like Because you enjoy the yeah. zero to one phase. So after two never years, know. who knows, right? But yeah, that's awesome, man. You know, once again, congratulations on, you know, such a great success. You fully, clearly earned it. And it's so great to see you shine and rise. But the other thing also I want to underline, a lot of people, they just win, you know, and they're, they're happy and they're winning. But I feel like I felt that you were genuinely like a rising tide that it was lifting other boats, it was sharing your lessons, you're celebrating in public, you're doing this interview and like coming on a bunch of podcasts and sharing your stories and lessons. I think it's so awesome to watch that. So kudos on that too. Super cool. Thank you, KP. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Cool, man. Have a great rest of the day, all right? Yeah. Thank you. Cool.